Well, hello, my friends. Well, today we come to the book of Haggai in our journey uh, through the Minor Prophets. And I don't know if I've ever heard anybody teach on or preach on the book of Haggai. And it's such a cool book. There's, there's, It's a short book. You read it quickly. And there's so much going on, especially if you're interested in just the story of the Old Testament. Man, this comes at such an interesting time in the people of Israel, of God's, you know, human family on earth. And it's it makes me think about pioneer people, you know, people who first settled the plains or or came over on the Mayflower or, you know, were dreaming at this time in our culture about establishing something on Mars. <laughs> you think, man, the people who would be the first settlers Man, what would you do? Like, what would be the first thing you set up? What would be the would, would it be like to establish farming? Would it be to to build a general store? Would it would it be to build a, a meeting house for the community so everybody could get together and have barbecues? Would it be, uh, you know, barns for the farm animals? What would be the first things you do to set up a culture? Well, that's exactly what's happening in the book of Haggai. So if you're thinking about the narrative of the Old Testament and where this kind of fits in, you kind of think, okay, we've gone through like the the major prophets. We've gone through like the divided kingdom and the, you know, like Elijah and Elisha and that's behind us. And then now we've gone through, uh, we've been exiled to <clears throat> the Northern kingdom to Assyria and the Southern kingdom over to Babylon and and God said this would be a time of 70 years, and we're getting really close to the end of that 70 years. In fact, um, the book starts in chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the second year of Darius the king. You know that name, Darius, right? The book of Daniel. You think of the book of Daniel giving us a decent picture of what those 70 years were like in, in exile in Babylon. In the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. If you're looking for baby names, Jehozadak is a pretty good one. Zerubbabel uh, is not bad. Um, so, um, so this is actually one of the easiest books to date. You remember that Babylon had fallen to the Syrians and Darius is this king that comes up and and the difference between the Babylonians and the Syrians is that the Syrian kings like they had an eye on letting people keep their religions uh, of of the conquered people and even resettling like so the people that they had brought to Babylon they had this idea of letting them go back and resettle their homeland. And so can you imagine these first groups of people that, that got to go back and resettle Jerusalem? And it had been 70 years, so there were some who probably remembered Jerusalem and Judah before captivity, but they were pretty elderly at that point. And even their remembering was not the height of, you know, this was not Solomon's kingdom and, and, and you know, David's rule. This was many, many years after that where um, Judah had been oppressed by the Assyrians. Jerusalem had been raised by the Assyrians before Babylon came and drew them away. So, so they really were starting from scratch, but it wasn't just from scratch because it wasn't a blank slate. You know, if we went and colonized Mars, there wouldn't be any Martians that we, you know, to to tell us, hey, don't be here. But but as they go back to Jerusalem, to Judah, you think about stories from the book of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra, and you go, oh, there were these Canaanite peoples who were not excited about a strong Jewish nation in the Jewish homeland. And so they have to you know, they're fighting against wild animals are, you know, they have to protect the the herds from wild animals. They have to to guard against the weather. And then not only that, but they have to protect themselves from these other people groups. So you can see that, man, there was a lot to do very quickly. So where would you get started? What would you build first? You know, the other thing just from this first verse that we are introduced to in a really profound way is the three main like great characters of this resettlement period or this the beginning of of resettling the promised land 
So you have Haggai, who's a prophet, and then you have Zerubbabel, who is um, uh, the the governor of Judah. So he's, you know, probably on um, Darius's staff. He sees himself as, um, you know, answerable still to to Babylon, and yet. He is a Jewish person who is excited about reestablishing a Jewish culture in the Jewish homeland. And the covenant is like back in play. We've got Jewish people, God's people in the promised land. This is very, very exciting. And so he's the governor. He's the political figure at the time. And then it also says we have Joshua, who is the high priest. Oh, that is interesting that the man who is the high priest, as we are reestablishing civilization in the promised land, his name's Joshua. Well, where have we heard that before? That is the same name of Moses' successor who initially established civilization here in the promised land. That is a, a wonderful truth. And then you go, well, what is Joshua mean? Well, it means God's salvation. In fact, it's the the Hebrew name Yeshua that that is Jesus. So how like as we get closer and closer to New Testament times, just the the images of Christ, the the types, the foreshadowing that le- that leads us to think, oh man, Jesus is going to be the culmination. Jesus is going to be the one in whom all of this is fulfilled. It just comes at you fast. In fact, I would even say that one of the things is we look at um, the political leader, uh, the prophet and the king. We say, oh, man, these are all fulfilled in Christ, in the new Jerusalem, in the new covenant, in the new heavens and the earth. There will not be a division of these leadership roles, but rather Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our political leader. He's the king. And Jesus is the one who speaks to his people directly. Man, does this make you homesick for the new heaven and new earth? In fact, it's one of the big ideas of of the book of Haggai. And then we'll get into Zechariah, maybe spend a couple days in Zechariah. I don't know what we'll do with Malachi. I might want to preach a sermon series on Malachi in the not too distant future. So we may save that for that. But the second chapter of Haggai, which we won't get to today, we'll, we'll save for our discussion in Zechariah, but is all about this, an eye on not only reestablishing Jerusalem and Judah in the time of Haggai, but also an eye on, oh, God is doing something for all people that will be a homeland, this new heaven and new earth, this new thing that God will bring forth in the person of his son, Jesus, and then breaking forth to to heaven. Um, so those are the three great characters in the book. And, and you do think, okay, so what would you do um, if you were going to be one of these people who went to start the culture anew? What would be the first buildings you built? Well, you'd have to take care of the animals. You'd have to build barns and and, you know, establish pasture land and, and, and build pins for the, the farm animals. And you'd have to have houses for people to live in. You'd have to build some of those. And then you'd have to build some of the things that, that just societies need, you know, whether it would be a carpenter shop or a blacksmith shop or, or you know, the things that the nuts and bolts of a society. And, and truly, this is where their energies went. They went to kind of building a civil society. And so in verse three of chapter one, the word of the Lord comes by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. And it says this, is this a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, while this house lies in ruin? Talking about the temple. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. Uh, he who, uh, who he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. OK, so this is one of the big ideas, really two big ideas in the first chapter of Haggai. And one of them is, man, the temple comes first. If you want a prosperous society, if you want a prosperous life, then, man, you don't start with 
building out all of the things of economy and politics and education and whatever, and then someday get to honoring God. Rather, the temple comes first and it goes right in the middle of town. And, you know, the New Testament would tell us, where's the temple now? Well, you're the temple. I'm the temple. We are the temple. The, what the temple is, is the, the dwelling place of God on earth and, and his spirit indwells us. It's, it's Christians that are the temple. And maybe we might think, man, how would we apply this except by saying, look, in your life, in my life, in our life, man, God comes first. Before we build prosperity in all kinds of other ways, there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. There's nothing wrong with being smart. There's nothing wrong with working hard and having a good job and doing all of that. But man, the temple comes first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff. It'll be added to you. Man, as the people go to settle the land, this prophet comes and goes, hey, while you're settling the land, hey, be sure the temple comes first. It's not appropriate for you to live in paneled houses. You're you're trying to establish your own comfort, your own safety uh, by, you know, building yourself nice houses. But why don't you start by building a temple, by honoring God, by making him and his um, glory, his fame. What do you want to be known for, Israel? You want to be known as a thriving economy? Or you want to be known as the people who have the temple of the living God? So then down in verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Man, Ob I'm sorry, Haggai is such an encouraging thing to read because in most of the minor prophets that are before the exile, you do not read that the people get the point. And here there's this remnant, there's this faithful group of resettlers who they hear, hey guys, stop building your own houses and build a temple. Make God the center of your culture. Don't make you your, the center of your culture. And it says they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And how encouraging is it too? The governor did it. The political figure did it. And the priest did it. And the prophets involved. And you go, oh man, this is truly an exciting time. And the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent them. So they obeyed the voice of the Lord and the words of Haggai the prophet. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, um, the host, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. Maybe we might think about it like this, man, they have to build the temple, but they don't have to do it alone. They have to act. They have to obey. But in their obedience, God says, man, I am with you. So along with this idea of, of man, put the temple in the center of your life, like make your relationship with God, his fame, his glory, put that right in the middle of your life and then trust him with the rest of the stuff. And, and there'll be time enough for the rest of that stuff because you're going to take that perspective into your job, into your family, into your hobbies and, and everything you do will be as someone who has Christ in the center of their life. But there's this other piece to it that, is so profound to me. And it's basically just comes down to this. Look, you have to do it. You have to make a decision to build the temple, but you're never going to do it alone. In our obedience, God meets us there. You know, it's not true that God forces us into obedience, but it is also not true that God is far away in our obedience. So you got to do it, but you're never going to do it alone. So guys, in your life, in your family, in your vocation, in your hobbies, in your thought life, in the books you read, in everything you do. Man, build the temple first. Like, pour into your spiritual life, your inner man. And then as you do that, know that you're not going to do it alone. 
but that God will be there with you. Come on, man. Let's be, be people who build the temple, huh? Have a great day.